Jay. Jay Shear. Jay Shear. Jay Shear. Jay Shear. Business Consultant. Jay Shear. Jay Shear Business Consulting. Welcome. I'm Jay Shear with Jay Shear Business Consulting. We build solid foundations for service-based businesses to grow and scale and achieve the results and success they deserve. And you've joined Business Minds Coffee Chat. How do we get people to see what we're saying? Well, this is foundational to all communication. Can we harness the power of visual thinking and visual language to achieve a more successful future? Well, stay tuned because on this episode, we're going to explore these questions and more. Our guest is a visual thinking expert. He's the CEO and co-founder of Big Blue Gumball, a management consulting firm. He's an adjunct professor of leadership at both NYU and Columbia University. He's a TEDx and keynote speaker and the author of the book, Visual Leadership, Leveraging the Power of Visual Thinking in Leadership and in Life. On top of all that, he has found time to read an average of one business book a week for over 20 years. Please welcome Todd Churches. Todd, it's great to see you. Thank you so much for being here today. Thanks for having me, Jay. This is great. I look forward to talking to you. You always have, you have such a great radio voice. So I always uh, enjoy listening to your podcast. So you're such a pro. Well, outstanding. Well, thank you so much. And, and you know, you and I had an opportunity to meet through a mutual business associate of ours. And since that time, you and your story and your work has been so impressive to me. And I just felt, I felt the need to reach out to you to connect and really begin to learn more about who you are and, and how you serve the business community. So I'm super excited about jumping into this conversation. And I thought a good place to start for us to give some context is to share a, a thumbnail sketch about your backstory, because my gosh, you, you, your background is so diverse. You've been involved in so many different areas, and I would love for you to highlight and touch on your professional background and really what has led you to the work that you're doing today. Sure. I love that question because I'm innately curious. In fact, I keep this on my desk all the time. It's a little curious George. Talk about visuals. Curious George reminds me to always be curious. And one of the things I'm always curious about is people's backstories. Like there are very few people who are doing today what they envisioned when they were in high school or college, unless you're like a doctor or a lawyer and on that track. So many of us like go from one thing. I would say that my students at NYU, we talk about, I teach in the HR master's program, um, talk about having a career path as if it's some walk in the park with the stepping stones laid out for you. But it really is more like a career roller coaster with ups and downs and twists and turns and exhilarating highs and terrifying plummets, right? So that, that's what my career has been like. Um, in my TEDx talk, I actually opened with, uh, when I was a kid, people will say, Todd, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I'd say, I want to be Superman. And they'd be like, well, there's already a Superman. What's your backup plan if you can't be Superman? And I think I'd say, all right, Batman. So like those are my two, you know, on my radar, possible job uh, opportunities or aspirations. And then as I grew up, I realized that, you know, those would not be possible. But um, my dream was to work in television. So the next best thing, growing up as a baby boomer and TV junkie, um, was to work in the TV industry. So everything I did, I majored in English literature in, in college with a concentration in Shakespeare and poetry. So I do not have a traditional business background, got my master's degree in communication. Um, and then I worked in advertising in, in New York for a year for Ogilvy and Mather, one of the top agencies. And um, in fact, I had an experience where I got in the elevator, I heard some British gentleman say, can you hold the door for a minute? And in walks David Ogilvy. So he's like the legend of advertising. I almost passed out. And when I talk about having an elevator pitch ready, like, what would you say to someone in an elevator? At that age, at that time, at age 24, I had no, and he didn't say anything to me. So I almost like, again, suffocated because of ner nervousness and anxiety. But my first job was at Ogilvy and Mather, and I did media buying, and that was not an area of interest or specialty to me. So um, I wanted to be doing something creative. I wanted to be in the produ production side of things not, and media buying was more of a numbers job and I was not a numbers person. So great foot in the door, great experience. But after a year at Ogilvy and Mather, 
I decided to move out to LA. I visited a college roommate who moved out there. Um, so I moved out there with no, I just saw that Hollywood sign. It's like, this is where I belong. So New Yorker moves to Hollywood. And um, I had a series of temp jobs, part-time jobs. Um, I actually worked nights as a bouncer in a club, believe mm-hmm. it or not. I applied for a waiter job and they said, well, we don't need more waiters, but can you hold a clipboard and stand by the velvet rope and decide who gets in? And even though I'm an extreme introvert, I talk loud and fast because I'm from, a New York, I'm from New York, but I'm an extreme introvert. But anyway, so that door host job both um, boosted my confidence and, and made me a little survival money. So I had a number of jobs out there. I worked for Michael Nesmith of the Monkees for uh, almost a year. Baby boomers like us know who he is. My millennial students have no idea. Um, <laughs> so I worked for him in production for a while. And then I was at Aaron Spelling, just putting scripts together for Dynasty. Then I was in casting at Columbia Pictures Television. Um, I got a job at Disney and comedy development, working for a writer producer, which was my favorite job up till that point. Um, got laid off because his development deal ended. And then I was at CBS for a year with working for the worst boss who've ever, who's ever set foot on this planet. Um, and one of the things that drove me into management and leadership consulting is having some really horrible bosses in my life. So um, I did that. And then I worked in the theme park business as a project manager for a number of years. And I moved back to New York after 10 years in LA and got into management leadership development. So that's, I'll stop right there, but that's in a nutshell, that's uh, the early part of my career before I launched into what I currently do today. Love it. Talk about a diverse set of skills <laughs> and lots of different experiences to draw on. I'm, I'm curious, as, as you look back on moving from New York to Hollywood, you know, that's, that's a, that's a risk in and of itself, making that move without having anything in particular lined up. Fortunately, you had a, a friend there, right, to at least provide something of comfort there. Yeah, but- he was my roommate, and then I, I would meet other people out by the pool. I lived at the Oakwood Apartments, which is kind of like a transient kind of place that, you know, transplants just settle in there until they get their own place, but I ended up staying there for three years. But yeah, it's just I met some people and got jobs through word of mouth and um, yeah, so it's like when we start out, we're just trying to get our foot in the door, learn, build our network, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, absolutely. And that's something that I wanted to ask you about and maybe unpack a little bit because we we know that there is power in our network. There is power in building relationships. So especially in Hollywood where, you know, there's so many talented people but not as many jobs for all of those talented people. And the roles that you had w- would seem like they required quite a bit of connection, a lot of knocking on doors. So just, just share with us for a moment, if you will, about why relationships are so important in building your network and how that helped you at that stage in your career. Yeah, you can't, you know, it's, it's- it's very rare to just back in the day, you would open up the newspaper and you clip out the little ads and you'd send the cover letter and all that kind of stuff. And it would just end up in some dead letter file. Right. So it's really how do you get seen or, or how do you get bumped up to the top? And it is through our relationships. So it's our networks and it's friends. It's when meeting people, not saying, oh, how can this person help me? But how can I maybe help this person? And, you know, what goes around comes around sometimes. Sometimes it doesn't. I've since developed, I talk about in my book, my two G's, be genuine and be generous. Right. So be genuine, be be authentic. Don't play a role. Just be yourself and be generous. Always be thinking about how can I help this other person? Do I know someone? Can I connect them? Do I have a resource? Can I share the wisdom of my experience? Both. I do a lot of work around storytelling, right? Success stories, but also failure stories. Right. We learn as much from a cautionary tale of don't ever let this happen to you as we do from, in fact, in many ways more. All right. Because sex, success stories can't always be replicated, but from failure stories and cautionary tales, we can always remember, oh, I'm not going to let that happen to me, or I'm not going to make that mistake again. Um, Eleanor Roosevelt, one of her quotes that I love is, uh, learn from the mistakes of others. Life's too short to make them all ourselves, right? Oh, yes. So by talking to people and listening to podcasts and hearing other people tell their stories, we pick up some do's and don'ts, and uh, we learn from them. So, uh, yeah, I, I love that. And thank you for tying part of that story back to what you, one of the things that you talk about in your book. And I, I love the fact that you, you come to a relationship with a, from the perspective of serving first, right? Looking for ways that you can support, that you can help someone else, perhaps connect, connect them with someone else who could build a collaborative relationship together. 
versus coming into the relationship with your hand out yeah. saying, what can you do for me? Right. So serve first. You already mentioned about reciprocity. I think that's fantastic. And clearly it served you well. And that's one of the reasons why you and I are having this conversation yeah. today as a result of, of those types of relationships. Yeah. So I just I'm, want to say one of, the, one of the stories in my book that really resonates with people is uh, it's better to be, and I, I didn't make up this phrase, Dale Carnegie said this a hundred years ago, but it's better to be interested than interesting, right? Be, to take a genuine interest in other people. And the story I tell there was from uh, two years ago at a, we had a New Year's party at a friend's house and this actor guy, uh, we were like cornered in the kitchen. He was talking about how he can't break through and he keeps going on all these auditions and not getting it. And then he really wants to meet this one casting director who's the most powerful casting director in New York, who does all the CBS shows. He's like, I wish I could get to him and blah, blah, blah. And he kept talking and talking and talking and then finally walked away. He didn't ask myself or my wife what we do. Well, my casting director is my college roommate and my best friend, one of my best friends. And we had just had dinner with him an hour before this New Year's Eve party. He went off to a different party. But if he had even asked us one thing about ourselves, I would have said, hey, I happen to know him, let me pass your headshot along. But he didn't even make one slight effort to get to connect with us or know us. And my wife is a casting director. He never Amazing. asked her, what do you do, right? So we were like, you know, part of us, could we could have been gener generous and said, you know, let's see. You know, it's like you want to help people that, you know, are trustworthy and that you have a relationship with. And here, there was such a missed opportunity for this guy. Um, so it's just that, that cautionary tale of, you know, when you're talking about yourself, you're not learning anything about, either yourself or the other people. So uh, that story tends to really resonate with people. Yeah, it, it really does. And it just amplifies the statement or the quote that you gave uh, yeah. that Dale Carnegie said, and that's so true, be interested. And, I, and I'll tell you a quick little story. When I first got into the corporate world, the company that I went to work with, they asked me to attend a Dale Carnegie course. And it was a Carnegie course on human relations. And I had never heard of Dale Carnegie before. I was in my very early 20s at this point. And that course radically changed my life. Not only did it change my life, it changed me as a person. And it also changed the trajectory of my career and opened my eyes to an entirely different world. So I, yeah. I, I appreciate you you throwing that one down as a reference because it's it was very very important and valuable to me at the formative years of my career. Yeah, yeah, that's great. So let me ask you this: what, what is something that you believed about yourself in your early years that you found out wasn't true? Mm. That's a good question. I was just talking to a friend the other day about how, um, yeah, I, I describe myself as a three B's kind of guy, a back, traditionally by nature, a back of the room, behind the scenes bookworm. I'm a big, as you mentioned, I'm a big reader. I was always in class in all my years of school. I never sat in the front row. I was always in the back row. I'm six foot four. So I always kind of like slunk down. So I didn't want to stand out in the crowd, shy, introverted, some social anxiety disorder. So I always try to like just blend in. I never stuck out. Um, and I always figured in my career that my work would speak for itself. I would do an amazing job and people would pluck me out of obscurity and say, hey, you need, you know, I was passed over for so many promotions because I never was able to sell myself. So your work doesn't sell yourself. You have to sell yourself. It's like I wrote this book. I need to promote. I need to talk about it. I need to be on podcasts. I need to. Um, so I need to kind of. Dan Pink wrote a book called To Sell is Human, right? Even if we're all in sales, right? Even if you're just selling yourself, even if you're on a job interview or you're meeting with a, pitching a client, um, you know, there's the traditional salespeople, but we're always, we need to influence, right? We need to get things, um, you know, done through and with other people. So I think that's a big thing. I always thought of myself as um, this introvert, and I still am, I still am an introvert, but I need to push myself out of my comfort zone every day. Um, and, and there's high school Todd, and then there's, you know, I just turned, I won't give my age away, but my, yesterday was my birthday. But, um, and then there's this visual leadership, Todd. I'm the same person, but sometimes it's very easy to revert back to that high school introvert who's shy. And, and but if I had stayed that way, I wouldn't have done a TED talk. I wouldn't be teaching at NYU in Columbia. I wouldn't have published a book. I wouldn't be on this podcast with you. So I, you, you, you can reinvent yourself um, if you work at it. So that, that's what I would say is like, I always thought this is who I am and how I'm going to be but we put those limits on ourselves. And there's a whole 
Carol Dweck wrote that book on mindset, growth mm -hmm. mindset versus a fixed. So if you have a fixed mindset, like I'm an introvert, I'm that I'm a three B's guy, I'm never going to be able to do anything differently. But over the years, I've learned little by little, you stick, stick your toe in the water or you dive off a diving board and then you keep going on a higher and higher and higher one. Um, so that's what I would say is like, you can reinvent yourself. You, we label ourselves, but we could change the label. Yeah. yeah, that's an incredibly powerful message. And it's one that I want to make sure that our listeners right now are paying very close attention to. And I know that everyone listening is going to be taking notes throughout this conversation. And this is one that I would definitely write down. And it's that, you know, we we tell ourselves certain stories and we can change those stories. We can reframe those stories. We can use different visuals, even though we may feel like we're stuck or that we, we put ourselves in a certain box. Remember that there is nothing that you can't achieve if you're able to visualize it, see it, and then actually put the plans in place to move forward. And you've done just that. And I, and I just wanted to ask you, in the context of comfort zones and pushing yourself outside of the comfort zones, because you and I spoke before the cameras were rolling about the number of podcasts that you've been on since your book came out. And you obviously realize the value and see the value of putting yourself out there, getting your message out, because it's so vitally important, right? So what process do you go through in your mind or what activities do you do to get yourself ready to put yourself in a position where you're empowered and when you are more confident to be able to do the things that you need to do to shine and show your greatness. Yeah, thank you. Well, I appreciate the word, the word greatness. You know, a few things. I, I talked about two Gs, be genuine and generous. I also added be grateful. Uh, my friend Chester Elton wrote this book right behind me called Leading with Gratitude. So like, be grateful for the opportunity, be grateful. Um, you know, this, you talk about reframing. I love the metaphor of, putting a new frame around something. And, and the, one of the examples I used to illustrate that is my wife bought a painting at a store, at a, like a home goods kind of place. I thought it was just okay, but then she got it framed. And with the frame, I was like, wow, I love it, right? Same painting, different frame changed everything, right? So same thing for yourself, put a different frame around yourself and you, you may pop or shine and be seen and you can change the frame, right? You could change the frame every six months or a few years, right? So I think that's, I love that metaphor of reframing and reinventing ourselves. Um, in addition to my G's, I also talk about two, two P's, passion and purpose, right? If you're passionate, you can tell like I'm passionate about what I do. So if you're passionate, you're excited about it. You don't mind, instead of saying, oh, I have to do this podcast with Jay today. It's like, I can't wait to talk to Jay about my book and, you know, um, and purpose is what is this meaning behind something, right? This is the, I was just thinking of the classic story about two bricklayers. Yes. The first one, what are you doing? He said, I'm laying bricks. Yes, the second one, what are you doing? Same job, he said, I'm building a cathedral or I'm building a hospital or I'm building a school, right? Same task, but the other person's going about their business with a sense of purpose and meaning. So that's what I would say is like, if you're passionate about what you do and you're doing it with meaning and you're helping other people and you're making the world a better place. Um, like I mentioned, I've had so many horrible bosses. So my personal mission statement is making the world a better place, one leader at a time. And to me, everyone is a leader, right? So if I start wow. with that, with my students or whoever I meet, how can I help this? If I can help one person be a better manager or leader, think about all the people that person will impact in a positive way as opposed to in a negative way. So I learned from all these bad experiences and horrible bosses that I've had. My book is dedicated first to my wife, secondly to my parents, and third to all the horrible bosses without whom none of my career would have been possible. So um, I acknowledge yeah, turning the, the lemons into lemonade. Um, so that's what I would say is like have a sense of passion and purpose. And I think it's contagious, right? You, you don't have to fake it. And you don't have to say, oh, have you ever had a job where you look at your watch? You think, when's this day going to be over? And it's only two o'clock. And you think, oh, my God, I'm never going to make it through this day. I haven't had that in years because a lot of times it's 2 a.m. And I haven't shut down yet because I'm so engaged in, in what I do. So um, Beauti beautifully said, beautifully I said, I love that. So thank you for sharing. And, and we're going to dig into your book here, because as you mentioned, you acknowledge at the very beginning, those horrible bosses, and you talk about that in the book. And this is one of those areas that many of us can certainly relate to. And I love the fact that you acknowledge them because without those experiences, you wouldn't be able to deliver the way that you are today. You had to go through those, ex those experiences. You learned what the best leaders do and what leaders don't do very well. And 
I think those are incredibly important experiences. So let's let's talk about visual leadership. But really, before we dive into it, there's just a couple things I'd love to find out from you. One is, what was the experience like for you bringing this book to life? When did the when did the spark for writing the book first begin? And then just walk us through what the experience was. And then also after you've done that, please share with us the meaning of the cover. Sure, sure. Uh, well, firstly, um, as you mentioned, I'm a business book addict. And, and when I moved back from to New York for after uh, my 10 years in LA, I ended up with a job at a leading, I won't mention the name, management leadership training company, and they hired me to revamp their mini MBA program. So even though I had an English background, English literature background, I wasn't a, an MBA person, I had the life skills and the job skills that they thought could do it. So in the process of doing that, I needed to both work with all these amazing management leadership trainers, but also I needed to start reading all these books. Like who is Peter Drucker? Who is Warren Bennis? Who is, um, you know, I needed to learn these names. And so I started reading these business books and I'm a voracious reader. So instead of reading Shakespeare and poetry, I was reading business books and one after another, after another. And I was like, wow, None, I've never been managed and lead, led the way these books are describing. Like, why didn't my managers from all those years in LA read any of these books? Like, people are just thrown into management jobs. And it's, you know, you're the top salesperson, you're now the sales manager. It's like, that's a different job. That's a different skill set, right? Getting things done through and with other people. Um, we've seen in sports, right? How many great athletes were not great managers or coaches in this sport, right? There's a, a, the list is endless, right? So it's a different skill set. So once I dove into management leadership books, and I started reading like two or three, four or five a week. And over the 22 years since then, I've averaged one a week. And you can see my bookshelf behind me, those who are watching the video. Um, I'm still reading one a week. But after reading them, I started applying them in the training courses I was using. But then I started designing my own models. I would say, you know, if this model doesn't resonate with me. And I would, in the course of talking, I would create my own models, my own metaphors, my own stories. And then people kept saying, you know, you've read all these millions of books. How about writing one? You know, when are you going to write your own book? So I started keeping a journal and writing ideas down. I had a little stack of 2000, I'm not exaggerating, I would say 2000 pages of content piled up. So mm -hmm. when I, people kept saying, a friend of mine said to me, you're going to always be talking about someday when I write my book until you have a deadline. You know, there's a saying that which could be done at any time, which mo will most likely be done at no time. So without a deadline, it's like one of these days and one of these days just never comes around until I went to a leadership conference up in Lake George, New York, and I met a guy named Rob Salafia, who wrote the book Leading from Your Best Self, which is right behind me. And I said, how did you tell me? How did you get your book published? Because it was published by McGraw-Hill. He said, well, you have to get an agent. And he gave me all his tips. He said, oh, if you, I'd be happy to introduce you to my agent. His agent took me on, pitched my book. It took about a month to work on the proposal. It was like a 35, 40 page proposal. Um, and they want to know when you write a book, because there's a million leadership books out there, right? They want to know, what books out there is your book similar to, but how is it different from and better than the, what's out there, right? So you need to, I, th I think that's the case with any of us, right? What differentiates us? What makes us stand out? You look at a higher management consultant or a marketing person, whatever, there's a million of them, right? What makes you mm -hmm. stand out from the crowd? So what's your, I always say, what do you want to be known as the guru of or the go-to person for? And my hook was by all my years of working in Hollywood and my English background and watching TV, you know, as a TV addict, the visual leadership approach was my framework, the lens through which I saw everything. It's like, how do you get people to see what you're saying? I've had a few defining moments in my years where I picked up a pen and sketched something out or used an image or a prop or something to where someone said, oh, now I get what you're talking about. So my visual leadership concept we'll talk about in a second is merging visuals with leadership, right? It's taking visual imagery, metaphor, mental models, and storytelling and applying it to the practice of leadership so that you, because some, how many managers say to someone, oh, didn't you get the memo? Or you should know what I was talking about. It was totally clear in my head, but you didn't download it to the other person, right? They don't see what you're seeing and, and they don't hear what you're saying. So that's, that's what resonated with me. And so when I got the book deal, then the panic set in, right? It was like literally nine months, you have to deliver your first manuscript. So I had to turn 2000 pages of notes piled up over 20 years into a 300 page book that people are gonna hold in their hands someday. So I just went to work and um, more was, I'll put it this way, more was left on the cutting room floor that, that made it into my book. So I always say um, in many cases with presentations or whatever we're doing, it's harder to decide what to leave out than what to put in. 
right? Mm -hmm. We always need to think about within the time constraint or you're talking to a client or whatever, what do I say, but what do I not say? Because you can't say everything, right? So that was my biggest challenge was how do I decide what to leave in, put in and what to leave out, but also how do I structure it so it has a co cohesive beginning, middle and end. That was the hardest part. Um, but once I started writing, it just flowed and I literally locked myself in this office during this for three months during the summer of 2019 and worked round the clock. I did not, I put aside all client work, everything else, and I just wrote 18 hours a day. Amazing. Truly amazing. Well, thank goodness that you had all of those, those notes and that content to be able to call through to create what you were able to give life to. So what an amazing process that you went through. So now share with us about the cover and, and where did that idea come from and what does it mean to you and what should it mean to us? Sure. Well, the eye on the cover, you know, when you think about, I mentioned this in my TED talk, when you ask people, what's the first word that comes to mind when you think about leaders, leadership, or leading, and they say vision, that's usually the first word. So what does it mean to be, to say someone's a visionary leader, whether you're Martin Luther King Jr. or Steve Jobs or Elon Musk, what does it mean? It means that you have a picture in your mind's eye and Shakespeare, where my Shakespeare background comes in handy, in Hamlet, Shakespeare coined the term to see something in your mind's eye. Horatio said to Hamlet, Hamlet said, I think I see my father. And Horatio says, where? And Hamlet said, in my mind's eye. Because Hamlet didn't know if he was seeing an actual ghost or an apparition or a figment of his imagination. So think about what that term means, to see something in your mind's eye. It means it's not out there. It doesn't exist in reality. You're not seeing it with your physical eye, but you can see it in your head. So how do you make that vision a reality? So that's the key component of visual leadership. Um, and then the cover of my book, originally I had a blue eye because my company is called Big Blue Gumball, so for branding purposes. But then I realized, and I got the feedback from people that the blue eye was not inclusive. And in the world of, that we're talking where diversity and inclusion and equity and belonging is such a hot topic and so important, I went with this rainbow colored eye that I'll just hold up to the screen. So the rainbow represents diversity of thought, diversity of culture, diversity of perspective. It's about just the fact as no one in the world has an eye that looks like this, no one in the world sees the world through the same lens as you do, right? Mm -hmm. Our backgrounds, our experiences, our culture, our upbringing, our successes and failures all shape who we are and how we lead and the lens through which we see the world. So the rainbow eye represents diversity and inclusion and that concept that you're, you, you have a unique perspective. And it also represents the rainbow and the colors represent creativity and innovation. We need to be creative and innovative in terms of... In, in terms of getting our ideas out there into the world. So that's what the rainbow eye represents. And then flipping the eye, the concept I came up with after the book came out, which was good. If you wait till all the ideas are in there, you're never gonna finish, right? You're never officially, at some point you need to press send and get send it to print. But sure, afterwards, sure. the idea of flipping the eye is take that eye and turn it around on yourself and look inwardly at your biases, assumptions, prejudices, values, belief systems, and, and realize that no one else sees the world as you do and question why you think what you do, why you see things in a certain way. And also, can you flip the eye and see the world through the lens of other people who are different from you um, in so many ways, right? Can you help them become leaders? Can you help them make their visions a reality? So it's not just about you. So that's the rainbow eye concept and that's the flipping the eye concept. And that's all just within the cover before you even open up the book. Wow, that really is remarkable as you describe that and you think about all the different types of meaning that fall within that imagery and that you were able to go from the blue eye to this full spectrum, but then create and attach meaning to it that's so, that's so deep. It's, it really is remarkable. Thank you for sharing. I appreciate that. I think Thank that's for important asking. for us to understand. So the, what I like about your book is that it is, it's practical and it's actionable, right? So it's not just theoretical. This is good content that we can actually use. So that's the first piece of it that I think is incredibly important. And I'm glad that it's, it's structured the way that it is. And it's really, I view it as a book about mastering leadership in both our personal as well as our professional lives. And you've broken the book down into really five different parts. You've got uh, you know, the visuals, you've got visual models, visual metaphors, visual stories, and then also then obviously visual leadership. So I would love it if you would 
walk us through and and maybe pick let's start with the the first section of it but if you would pick maybe one or two key points to touch on and i'd love to be able to give some some practical information that our audience can begin to apply in their own careers or their personal lives sure well the subtitle is leveraging the power of visual thinking in leadership and in life and i added the end in life because just as you point out these this is not just a management book this is a self-help book right it's basically and what's what resonates with people is you're already doing so many of these things but you never really realized it right we're all seeing the world through a lens but like if i gave you my glasses you would see things differently but for you, it might be blurry because we have different vision, right? So you can't just necessarily pass your glasses along to someone else and expect them to see things as you do, right? So it's like, how do you get people to see what you're saying? How does the lens, how does changing your lens change the way you see the world? If you see the world differently, it opens up the world of possibilities, right? So when you talk about the first category, using visual imagery and or drawing, right? So a picture's worth a thousand words is a, one of those sayings that goes back to Confucius. And, and but why is that? Why is it the, there, Napoleon said that a, a good sketch is better than a long speech, right? So it's like, regardless of culture or language, he's, he probably said it in French. I don't know if he, he spoke English, but it doesn't matter what culture or language. We always have that, you know, cave drawings. I talked about cave drawings, right? Cave drawings go back to 44,000 BC. So if you walk into a cave, and you see a bison being chased by a hunter with a spear next to a fire, that's a story, right? Someone that took someone's reality and put it, created an image from 40 something thousand years ago. And then our alphabet came from Egyptian hieroglyphics, which were pictograms. So they turned pictures into alphabet letters that we now use today. And then think about emojis, right? If you send someone a thumbs up or a heart or whatever. So our emojis that we use in our texts and Facebook posts are the modern day equivalent of cave drawing right? We are wired visually. So one of the things I don't do in my book, and this was great, it's always great to get, talk to people and get their advice. And, you know, one person said to me, don't, don't go into the brain science of visual thinking and why the brain process, that's not your specialty. It's like, I, I know how to drive a car, but if you ask me how a combustion engine works, I couldn't explain it to you, right? So I don't know what's going on under the hood. Same thing. I didn't want to start getting into the neuroscience of visual thinking, because that's my, not my specialty, but there are many books out there about that. I do mm -hmm. mention two theories though. Um, the picture superiority effect is a study that basically showed that when text and pictures are battling against each other, the pictures always win. So it's just the way our brains are wired. If you have an, a, a, an ad and before you read the text, you're gonna look at the image. No one's gonna read the text and then look at the image afterwards. If someone links in with you, would you connect with someone you didn't know if they didn't have a headshot? Probably not in most no. cases. Blog posts are read like 10 times more if there was an image than, than if there's not. Would you buy something on eBay or, or um, Amazon if there was no image just from the title and description? Probably not. So while you can't judge a book by its cover, you know, as we were just talking about, because you don't know what's inside, we do make judgments. We are either drawn in or we ignore something, right? That's the power of visual imagery all around us. So um, similarly, if you're driving down a highway at 80 miles an hour, a billboard needs to sell their message in that fraction of a second, right? If you had a long text-based thing, no one's reading that on a billboard, right? So you need to think about how do you communicate your ideas through visual imagery? And my article, my first article was published in Inc. two months ago called, Can You Draw What Your Company Does? And just think about that. Could you, without words, get up with a flip chart or a whiteboard and sketch out what you do and how you do it? And mm. It's an exercise that is really challenging for people, but then you have to explain it but you can explain it. And even if you have ICD, which is a, what I call I can't draw syndrome, you know, if you can play Pictionary and charades, you can use body language and or lines or squares or circles to communicate an idea, right? So I get people to think about how can I use imagery? For example, when I talk about being flexible, here's my little Gumby, right? We have to, sometimes we have to bend over backwards to help someone. Just using metaphors and props like this is fun, it's visual, it's creative. So I get people to say, all right, you could do this through PowerPoint slides, you could draw, you could use an image, just the whole idea is how do you get someone to see what you're saying and by using all these different methodologies. So that's, that's I'll stop right there, but that's topic one is using pictures either in addition to or instead of words. Perfect. So, so before you move on to the next piece of this, I want to throw a challenge out to everyone that is listening or watching this. So you just heard an exercise, you heard about an article that Todd wrote in Inc. Magazine. Can you 
can you in a picture describe what your business does? So I would challenge each of you to do exactly that. And I would love it if you would take a picture of that image that you drew and go ahead and send that to me. And I'm going to share that with Todd as well. So that's your challenge. It's a great it. exercise for you. Let's use your creativity and see what you are capable of creating. All right, Todd, that's keep actionable. going. Take some, so it's not theoretical, right? This is really actionable. And it's like um, the classic article, and I mentioned this in my Inc. article, is um, Southwest Airlines. On a napkin sketch, they sat down and said, what if we created an airline that just connected the three cities of Dallas, Houston, San Antonio? They drew a triangle. And it's like, that's an amazing idea. And that's how Southwest Airlines was born on a napkin sketch, right? So it's like the ability to just, you know, we talk about the power of the pen and who, he who wields the pen wields the power. If mm -hmm. you could sketch something out, you can really get people to say, yeah, now I get it. I, I get now because I'm looking at it. Um, in a way that when you described it, it didn't really resonate with me because I couldn't picture it. Fantastic. Okay, okay so take us, to, take us to the next section. So the next one's on mental models and framework. So if you have a company organizational chart, right, that's a mental framework that, that basically represents who reports to who and who has what jobs. So we don't think about that. Um, you know, it's the saying, think outside the box, which has become a cliche, but you can't think outside the box until you put stuff inside the box, right? Mm -hmm. So can you take a model? Can you take, whether it's a pyramid, a circle, a four box matrix, and can you plug in the life is messy and complex, right? So how do you take the complexity and simplify the complexity so that you can see not only the problem, but then solutions that you might not have seen. And the metaphor I, story I use as an example Let's say you're, you're having people over for dinner and you need to put out eight table settings, right? And you open up the silverware drawer and all the silverware is just thrown in there from last time. How long is it going to take you to put together eight settings versus you open up the next drawer and all the silverware is in its compartments, knives, spoons of different sizes, the forks, right? How much quicker will you be able to see what you need, right? So picture your life and your business as this messy silverware drawer where everything's just jumbled and thrown in versus how could you put something things into compartments so that you could categorize, systematize, organize. Now, we're not talking about putting people in boxes, right? We're not talking about labeling people and say, you're the fork, you're the spoon. What we're saying is, here are the tools in our toolkit. What are the tools that we can leverage to solve, to define a business problem and to solve a business problem? So anytime you can use any kind of process diagram, you can use post-its, you can use index cards, just you need to get the ideas out of your head onto some medium so that you can move things around, picture it, and then the solutions very often will jump out at you. I love that visual. Can I take that from you and use that? Sure, yes. Okay. That's what they're there for. Take it and use it. Perfect. So take us through to the next section. Yeah, so next is on metaphors and analogies, and this is where my poetry background comes in handy, right? When you say something is like something else, it helps people to gain that understanding, right? I talk about in my TED Talk and in my book, three words, why visuals, the three words are attention, comprehension, and retention. Attention, when you use visual images or visual language, it gets people to focus. It captures their attention. They can say, oh, now I, I'm looking at it. I can see what you're, what you're talking about, right? Comprehension, oh, not only do I see it, but I now understand it better, right? And then retention is now I'll remember it because that's the way our brains are wired. Um, the other theory, I mentioned the picture superiority effect, that why pictures are more powerful and, uh, and impactful than words or text alone. The other theory is called dual coding theory and dual as in the two sides of our brain, right brain, left brain. Mm -hmm. Left brain thinking is logical, linear, factual. Right brain thinking is the artistic creative side of our brain. When we use both in combination, it's more powerful than either one by itself. So that's dual coding theory. It gets coded in our brain in a certain way. So if you could use a metaphor, like for example, I keep this image on my desk. My wife got me this framed iceberg, right? We all okay. know the phrase, it's just the tip of the iceberg. What does that mean? The tip of the iceberg represents what we see versus what we don't see, right? When you first meet someone, your first impression, oh, do I like this person? Should I hire this person? Should we choose this vendor? That's just the tip of the iceberg. We need to dive beneath the surface to see what lies beneath. That's where that 90% is, right? Uh, when someone's an overnight success, we don't see the 30 years of failure and pain and blood, sweat, and tears that went into their becoming an overnight success. We just see that, oh, this person came out of nowhere. Meanwhile, how long did that take, right? So the iceberg is a great, just a single metaphor that could visualize for ourselves, here I'm seeing something, but what am I not seeing? What am I not asking? What don't I know? 
and it reminds us to dive beneath the surface. Also, like in the movie Titanic, it's a warning of, hey, we could crash into this thing if we don't dive beneath and see what's lurking down there, right? So the, you can spend an hour just talking about the iceberg as a metaphor that will help you to, again, solve, this is all about solving business problems, right? This isn't all just funding. These are creative ways of thinking differently to see possibilities and solutions that maybe we hadn't thought of before. Beautiful. Love that one as well. So let's go to visual stories. That would be the next section. Well, I've told a lot of visual stories already. So we'll talk about that. One other point I want to make about metaphors before we move forward. The metaphor needs to resonate with your audience. If you like, I use a lot of baseball analogies. So I'm a big Yankees and Mets fan, right? But if I'm talking to my 25 year old female students from China in my, in my um, NYU class, a story about Joe Torre and Derek Jeter is not going to resonate with them, right? Or a baseball analogy saying something came out of left field or that's a grand slam. They don't know what I'm saying, right? We always need to think about who's our audience and what's our purpose. And so if I'm talking with someone from India, I may use a cricket analogy or metaphor. If I'm talking to someone from Australia, I might choose rugby or someone from uh, Canada, I may choose hockey. So you want to speak the language of your listeners. So we always frame things through our own lens, but that's a perfect example of where we need to flip the eye, say, who am I talking to? What's going to resonate with Jay? Where's Jay from? What is he like? What is his interest? And what's going to help us con to connect? So for example, if you use a, me a metaphor from nature, that tends to be more universal than say a sports analogy or something else, right? So I could say, um, that's just, the, you know, let's get to the root of the problem. Uh, let's plant the seed for some ideas. I'm going to go out on a limb here. Let's see what's going to bear fruit. And if we do all this stuff, the sky's the limit. So right there, I just use five nature tree related analogies that anyone from anywhere in the world can relate to. So be aware of when the metaphors you use can either connect people and create clarity, or they can backfire and you cause confusion if it's a metaphor that the person doesn't understand. So I just wanted wow. to mention that important point about metaphors. And, and I am so glad that you did. And again, I know that our audience is taking plenty of notes right now because you're just, you're putting out so much fantastic information and so much knowledge here. And this is another one of those points that, you know, get that highlighter and mark this one, because not only in terms of communicating with you know, if you're in a leadership role, no matter what that role happens to be, whether it's in your professional life or in your personal life, but also for those that are on, in the marketing side, or if you own a business and you are marketing your products and services, getting crystal clear on who your audience is, who you're speaking to, and using the right type of visuals as well. Critically important. So great, great stuff. Let's keep going. I'm loving yeah, this. Yeah. And your, your show is called Coffee Chat, right? Now, I don't drink coffee, so but we could have an iced tea. I could have a Diet Coke, right? So coffee is a metaphor, right? It's, it's, the, it's the chat that's important. So that's another thing to think about is you're, like you were just saying, your branding and, and, and how could it be inclusive, right? So uh, like in Seinfeld, right? George says, you know, Coffee doesn't always mean coffee, right? So it's just a metaphor because my wife will say, oh, I'm meeting so-and-so for coffee. I'll say I'm meeting some for coffee. And she's like, well, you don't drink coffee. I'm like, it's a metaphor. It just means we're meeting, right? So uh, as opposed to over lunch or dinner or drinks or something like that. Absolutely. Um, storytelling. We are wired just as our brains are wired for visuals. Humans are wired for stories, right? Grandparents tell stories. Kids tell stories. If you say, so how was work today? Oh, you wouldn't believe what happened to me. That's a story. So a lot of times people put labels on themselves, like, um, yes, there's an art to storytelling and some people are better at it than others, but we all tell stories. It's just human nature. Uh, I was doing a, a storytelling workshop for a group of CEOs and one guy said, I hate storytelling. I'm terrible at storytelling. And I said, well, why do you say that? And he said, well, let me tell you what happened once. And he told this great story about why he was bad at storytelling. So everyone was like, yeah, that was an amazing story. So a lot of times we label ourselves because again, that fixed mindset, I can't draw or I can't tell stories. If you share the wisdom of your experience with generosity and genuineness and sincerity, um, you know, stories have what? A beginning, middle, and end. Stories have victims, villains, and heroes. Stories have a quest. Uh, 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 you know, stories have barriers and obstacles to be overcome, right? So it's all about framing um, a, a, a information in a way that resonates with people. Because again, stories are emotional, they're human, they, they resonate with people. They also connect you to people. If someone shares an emotional story, you, you feel closer to them, right? So, and it should be genuine and honest. It's not manipulative. One time, we all, this is a real story. I went, went to, there was a public speaker, an author who I idolized. I went to see him speak and he told this great story about this really happened to me like a week or two ago and blah, blah, blah. I went to see him like four years later. He opened with what? 
real true story. This just happened to me two weeks ago. Oh was, my gosh. It's like, yeah, you know, why, why don't you just say this once happened to me, right? As soon as you said true story, this happened two weeks ago and you told the same story four years ago, what do you think happened to his credibility and how much did I trust and believe everything that followed, right? So like, Boston. again, be honest, be candid, be sincere. You know, just again, when people see right through that, right? So as soon as you do that and trust, you know, we haven't even mentioned the word trust yet. It's crucial. I have a model called the hierarchy of followership that's in my book. How likely are people to follow you? It's nice. It's great if they like you. It's cool if they admire you. It's important that they respect you, but it's most important that they trust you, right? So right there, I painted a visual image of this four level pyramid, right? If you lose the trust and you plant the seed of doubt, and one of my stories in my book is called Why My Wife Doesn't Trust Me Anymore. I don't know if you got to read that story, but long story short, I once killed a cockroach uh, in our New York apartment uh, and then she saw another one, but it turned out it wasn't another one, it was the same one, I missed the first one. So I, I faked it that I killed it, so they wanted her to freak out. And then so then I had that moment of truth, do I tell her it's the same cockroach or do I make her think, uh-oh, we have infestation, we have to move out of our New York apartment. So I had to come clean and confess that I missed them the first time, I was just trying to put her mind at ease. <laughs> And now I say, so my, when it comes to bugs, my wife does not trust me anymore. I lost, luckily she trusts me in every other part of our relationship, but not when it comes to bugs. So right She's there, already got, she's got the phone number program for the pest control people. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so when it comes to bugs, I'm just a complete liar. So, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but, but again, that's, you know, I just told a story, the power of it. So you can actually picture that roach on the floor. You can picture, right? So I wasn't even intending to do that, but when you tell a story, it's, it's so much more important than saying you should never lie to your wife. Or if you lie to your wife once, she will never trust you again. It's like now that, that cockroach story, you know, you can picture the New York apartment and what that must have been like and, you know, her screaming. Um, so, uh, you know, there's a roach. So, again, the power of stories is that it, it, they're memorable. So as a boss, right, say you're as a manager, you could say this an employee, do this and don't do this. But if you say, let me tell you about the worst mistake. When I had your job, let me tell you about the biggest mistake I made. Don't you think that employees could be sitting on the edge of their seat? Like, I need to hear this, right? Oh, yes. So that's the, and same thing in my workshops. I have people reflect on and share stories. What was the best and worst boss you ever had? What was the best and worst team you were ever on? What made it good? What made it bad? What was your role? And in the process of storytelling, we learn from each other. And then we could pluck out from those, here are characteristics of a high-performing team, or here are the characteristics of leadership and effective management. Instead, you could just put up the list, but it's the stories that bring the list to life. So, honestly, so true. Fun. Yeah, so true. So we're not going to share the horrible boss stories because that's one that I would love everyone to read. So we're going to obviously provide a link to be able to purchase this book. But there's so much in this book that not only is is valuable, but it will completely change the way that you view or provide you the tools to change the way that you view the world and enable you to show up as a better leader, to show up as a better friend, a better spouse in every area of life. So we've covered just very, very brief pieces of this book, but to, for you to be able to get the full experience and be able to have all the tools and the resources that you need, go out and buy this book. Thank you. This Fantastic. is just the tip of the iceberg, right? Tip of the iceberg. Bingo. Just the tip of the, exactly, exactly. And one of the other so, stories I tell is the little, the Baskin Robbins little pink spoon analogy, right? You give people a little, why does Baskin, think about the millions of dollars that's in ice cream they give away just in little pink spoons, but you hope people will buy the cone and the gallon, right? Same type of thing as a business person. How can you give someone a little pink spoon, a taste of who you are, what you do, so that they buy the whole cone of you and keep coming back for another gallon, right? So again, that's another metaphor uh, to, to frame your, your business and your, and your approach to sales and marketing. Outstanding. Ah, that's, that's so good. So, so tell me today, what are, what are your non-negotiables? Well, one thing I've been saying no to is appearing on too many podcasts. So I said yes to you because I love your show and you're such a great guy and a great interviewer. But I've been getting, I've been blessed with getting a lot of requests. You know, people will see me on one podcast and say, oh, I'd love to have you on my podcast. So I've been more selective based on who's the audience, what is their listenership, does it fit my brand, who is the person, do I have a relationship with this person? So um, I actually wrote a blog post, funny you should ask, uh, last three months ago or a few months ago. Um, called uh, Make This Month a November. So this was, I wrote this at the end of October. So I was saying yes to everyone and everything. 
every request for a one-on-one, -on -one, every request to be on a podcast, or can you write an article, or can you blurb my book, or can you write a forward for my book? And I'm honored by those requests. It's amazing. But I was getting none of my own work done. I was completely losing my focus because I would be like, again, it'd be two in the morning. And I'm like, I have, I have 20 emails to respond to. I haven't even gotten to them yet because I've been doing all this other stuff because I've been saying yes to everyone. So I really had to start saying thank you, but can't do it or can't do it right now to request for one-on-ones or, or, or podcasts. Um, so I think that's a key thing. I think Warren Buffett always says that. He's like, you know, you want to be positive and you want to be a yes person. But if you say yes to everyone and everything, you get, it's hard to prioritize. So his orientation is assume it's a no, unless there's a really good reason to say yes. So that just, again, helps us to focus. And people talk about like have three big goals. And if what the, re if the request doesn't help you move the ball forward in any of those three goals, sometimes you just have to say thank you, but no, thank you. Or I can't do it right now. Wow. A, a, another great point. And, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting, the conversation about saying no to things has come up now for me over the past couple of weeks, more than it has in months prior. And it's so interesting, that topic, because like you, if you're someone who has historically said yes to everything, right, because you don't want to disappoint anyone. Yeah, you're a people pleaser, you want to make sure my exactly. to help, right? You want to help. That's, That's exactly Superman right. Happened. Right, we talk about Superman, Batman, Superman. What's that about? It's about being the rescuer, the superhero, making the world safer, right? So my superpowers, I don't have x-ray vision, but I have visual thinking as my Superman superpower. And Batman had his utility belt. I don't have a bat batarang, but I do have my coaching toolkit, right? So in a way, I am living out my Superman, Batman fantasy and trying to help people and make the world a better and safer place. Only I do it through my visual thinking, my teaching, and my coaching. There you go. What a great, what a great way to tie a bow around that. So I, I love it. So what is, what's one thing that would surprise us to learn about you? You've shared so much, but what is something that would surprise us that you haven't shared? Uh, yeah. I mean, one thing, I mean, I mentioned the introvert thing. It's like people assume I'm not because I do what I do, but it takes a lot and it's become more natural. It's become part of who I am, but I still revert back to that um, and again, one of the key word out the phrase is imposter syndrome, right? Like, who am I to write a book? Who am I to do a TED talk? Who am I to be standing up at NYU in Columbia teaching a class, right? So a lot of times we forget who we are, what we've accomplished and, and say, you know, there are people who could learn from us, right? There's always, it's like, I look to the people who are ahead of me, like Adam Grant and Dan Pink and, and Marshall Goldsmith, all these people whose books are on my shelf and say, wow, I'd love to be them someday, but then I look at this book right behind me that I, I carry it around in my head for 20 years. I can now physically hold it in my hands, which is like this amazing, I have a copy in every room of our house. My wife's like, are you ever good? It's under my pillow. It's just like the first time you open up that box and take this out and hold it in your hands, it's like, it's, a, it's like, uh, we don't have kids, but I assume it's like having a, we do have a puppy that we just got, but it's like having a kid, right? It's like you created this thing that you now own and you can be proud of and, and love. And um, so it's like, I think that's it. It's like the imposter syndrome. It's like, yes, I have. Give yourself the recognition for what you've accomplished and know there's so much more that can be done, but also you need to stop and kind of pause and, and celebrate successes and reward yourself. And um, you can always do more, but you can't always have that feeling of, I didn't do enough, right? So sometimes mm. you just have to, and one of the challenges for working, you know, working for yourself as I do is there's no off switch, right? Um, yesterday was my birthday. I took the, the day off. I literally, other than responding to emails, a few emails, I didn't have any Zoom calls. I didn't work on any proposals. I just spent it with my wife and my dog and just relaxed. And it was just, a, so it's like, you need to allow yourself to do that and give yourself permission to do that um, regularly. So I'm trying to do that more. So I work weekends. I'm like, I take a shower at midnight. Um, and a lot of times I'll come out and instead of going to bed, I'll get a million ideas in the shower and I'll come out and work for four more hours, right? And go to bed at four in the morning and, and work on four or five hours sleep. It's like, that's not sustainable, especially as you get older. And it's just, you have to kind of give you, allow yourself, especially now with the pandemic and working from home and there's no, yes, you don't have that commute and you're not traveling, you're not on planes. But the flip side, as we've all found, is the burnout factor of, there's, if you don't give yourself an off switch or create some boundaries and some space, you can find yourself working 20 hours a day. Exactly. Oh, so good. So much value in what you just said. And one that I think that many of us can certainly relate to, Todd. 
And, you know, that that off switch, it's very difficult to find at times, especially when you are a creative like you are. Right. So when you get into a flow state and there's so many ideas that are that are coming and so much that you want to be able to accomplish. So I totally get that. I so first of all, on my desk, the, 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 the off the off switch and the dimmer. Right. Sometimes we just dim it. Sometimes we say, all right, I'm going to dial it up, but I need to dial it back. And other times you just flip the switch, turn it off and say, you know what? Done, done for the day. So I keep yes. that, that's one of the visuals I keep. Also one of the other visuals is, is this one. We need to open up our mind to create space for new ideas and new possibilities. If we're, our minds are closed to doing things the way we've always done it, there's no room in there for innovation. So again, just another example of using, you know, you don't have to draw, you don't have to create PowerPoint, but just think metaphorically, think visually to get your ideas across tells a powerful story right there. Well, happy belated birthday. And I want to thank you so very much. I'm grateful for you for being here today, for bringing your book to life for all of us to be able to learn from, for you sharing your experiences and your background. And it's just, it's just been an amazing conversation. And I want you to know how much I, I appreciate it. And I'm excited for all of those that are listening or watching to be able to consume your content. So before we leave each other, where can we go to connect with you? Sure. The two best ways are my website, toddchurches.com. And if you go there you, and you subscribe to my newsletter, you can download my list of my top 52 one a week. Uh, business leadership books. You don't have to read one a week, but that's the list I came up with. Those are the books that had the greatest impact on me. So toddchurches.com or just go to LinkedIn because I live on LinkedIn. So uh, connect with me. Say you saw me on Jay's show. Uh, we'll be connected. We can follow each other. I'm always happy to, to meet new people and LinkedIn is the best way to connect. All right. Terrific. Well, we will absolutely provide links to those in the show notes. And again, thank you so much for being on Business Minds Coffee Chat. I appreciate you, Todd. Thanks, Jay. I'm inspired by your shirt and by you. So thanks for having me. Uh, well, thank you. And for all of you, thank you so very much for watching and for listening. Please take a moment to subscribe, rate, and also leave us a comment. We would love for you to share with us one to two takeaways from this episode. And also, don't forget to send me that email with your sketch. I look forward to seeing those. And to enjoy more episodes and to learn how Jay Shear Business Consulting can help build a solid foundation for your service-based business, just visit jshearbusinessconsulting.com. And until next time, keep learning and growing. Go pick up a copy of Visual Leadership, and we'll see you on the next Business Minds Coffee Chat. Take care. Jay. Jay Shear. Jay Shear. Jay Shear. Jay Shear. Business Consultant. Jay Shear. Jay Shear Business Consulting.